Welcome back to Daily Devotions with Philip. I am Dad. Oh, no. It's Daily Devotions with, with Dad. Dad. You're... Philip! I'm... Seth? Yeah. He's... Done. We're... Not. There you go. Good job, Philip. Okay. <laughs> so, it's been a little while since we've done a devotion. I'm sorry. We did finally get up our Grace Like Rain music video. We actually lost some of the video footage of it. So, uh, really? we did. Yeah, so that's why we did basically a music video looking thing of it with just pictures of rain. So, I'll put a link somewhere to it for you to go see that if you haven't seen it yet. Um, otherwise, I'll also put up here. A, uh, or over there. Or over there. Maybe I'll do it over there this time. Yeah. Where do you want it? You over want it over here. there? Okay. I mean, I'm wearing yellow and the bell might be yellow. The bell is not yellow, but that's okay. Ooh. We're going to put up like magic. Ready? There it comes. A subscribe button. Please click it and then hit the, uh, the bell icon um, so that... Uh, you'll be notified of future videos when we post them. We're going to do a devotion today, again, from the Institute for Creation Research, from their uh, devotional uh, Days of Praise. This one is called Grow in Grace, and it's based on Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Philip, would you read that for us? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Second Peter 3.18. <laughs> These last words of the Apostle Peter urge us to grow in each of two important phases of the Christian life, grace and knowledge. You already said that. I didn't. You did. I didn't. Before we had a little conversation, you did. No, but then I'm, but I edited that out so they didn't see that. Uh... Uh, so it, it didn't happen. Can you also get this word out? Yeah, but I won't, because this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Such growth into him in all things will indeed give glory to him now and forever. And that is based on Ephesians chapter four, verse fifteen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter four, verse fifteen, which says, Philip. But speaking the truth and of the may grow up in it to him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth and love may grow up to him and to him in all things, so in grace and in knowledge. When we first become Christians, we are newborn babes. Uh, that's, I don't know, you can see that out of 1 Peter 2 2, which says, as newborn babes desire. 2 2. two, two. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But as newborn babes, our spiritual birth has been by the word of God on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, so the Bible does refer to people who, when they first believe on Jesus Christ, as newborn babes, right? And the one thing that a newborn baby has to do is what? But they do have to grow, right? Babies have to grow. Anything that doesn't, wow! Anything that doesn't grow is dead. And so, yeah. as Christ, as Christians, Philip, as Christians, we don't want to not grow because that means we're dead. dead, dead Christians, right? So, as the Christian life began with the Word, it can only grow with the Word or on the Word. Again, First Peter two two says, "As newborn babes." Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So it's it's saying, hey, you you guys are new Christians. You're like babies. Babies need milk, and the word of God is that milk, right? So we should be reading God's word. Here in First Peter two two, when it says of the word, desire the sincere milk of the word. It's the Greek word logikos, elsewhere used only in Romans twelve one, where it's translated reasonable. It's the source of our English word logical. New Christians must be must feed on unadulterated logical truth if they are to grow. And this can only be found where? 
Mm. In the Bible. In the Bible. That's right. In the Holy Scriptures, Dr. Moore says. And it is reasonable. I mean, the Christian faith is not one of... It's not a blind faith. We have evidences. We have all kinds of stuff for us. We have the very world around us testifies as a creation that it had a creator, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And some people believe that the world just magically appeared. Yeah, well, yeah, they do. Yeah. They would say in the beginning nothing exploded. And the, they would just say that things popped into existence. It just, it all sort of happened, and then once it happened, it just sort of developed. They think they popped into existence, too? Uh, I mean, ultimately, yeah. They think that people came about through a slow progression of changes over time so that initially there was nothing and then there was something and then there was the very first living cell we don't know where that came from nobody wants to talk about that they just assume it existed and then it developed and over time it became bigger and then it was multicellular and then it got bigger and bigger and and it and through mutations and changes over t- over billions and billions of years we eventually got to you. It's the goo to you theory. You get from some goo... To you. To you. Now, I personally don't buy that. Right? The Bible tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that we have a creator, someone who loves us from the beginning, who before you were even formed in your mother's womb, the Bible says, he knew us. So that's mm-hmm. that doesn't sound random to me. Does it he sound always random? Knows, he even knows what will happen in the, in thousand nine hundred ninety nine in that year. He knows what will happen then. Well, the one thing that's true is I have no idea. But you're right. God would know. That's right. I know what would happen in the year. What? I still see laying down dead. Okay. (laughs) There is another word used for babes in scripture. It's the Greek word nepios, which means without... Nepios? Nepios. It means without speech. This word is used for toddlers, children who are old enough to walk, but yet not yet able to speak plainly or to act unselfishly. It is used for... Carnal Christian. Do you know what carnal means? Nope. Carnal means fleshly, of the earth, of the world, worldly Christians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. So he's in that case, he's talking about carnal Christians who, who were without speech. They don't have... They don't have that, they haven't been fed that diet of logical, reasonable truth, and so they can't converse well. They're like toddlers. They've grown up and they've kind of stopped growing. Let's go on. Carnality in Christians is arrested growth. Arrested means stopped. Okay, so when you see arrested, that means stopped. Carnality in Christians is arrested growth at the babes in Christ stage and is clearly abnormal. Again, that's somebody who's born again, who becomes a Christian, who you know falls in love with Jesus or whatever, and uh, and then nothing happens to them. They don't pursue it. They don't find themselves in a good church. They don't open the Bible. They don't read the Word. I mean, we could we could argue about their salvation, but the truth is, they certainly never have grown. Such stumbling, quarrelsome babes need to be fed with meat as well as milk if they're to grow. In Hebrews it says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. If, if all you did was drink milk every day, we could assume that you were still a baby, right? Because you, you need more than milk, right? To sustain yourself. And I don't mean Pop-Tarts. I mean cheeseburgers and ravioli. Right? Is ravioli good for us? No, my point is, it's not that it's bad for you. My point is that 
if all you do is drink milk, you can only grow so far. There's a point at which your body, your physical body, needs more food. It needs more stuff than it can get from just milk. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. If all you're doing is drinking the milk of the word and you're not getting into and studying and trying to dig deep and getting the real meat out of the word, then you're just a baby. Because only babies have an entire diet of milk. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Let's, let's go through it. The scripture says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So what the writer is saying is that if you, if all you do is get the milk looking for nourishment, get the milk out of scripture, you're not digging deep, right? You're unskilled in the word. You're just reading it and going, okay, hey, look, I read, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth today, right? So you read that, but you didn't dig into it and go, well, what does created mean? When was the beginning? What, what, do, what, do the, what is the heavens and the earth? What does that mean? What are the words? What is the writer saying? What did the Holy Spirit intend for us to understand in Genesis chapter 4 when, when uh, 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 Eve gives birth to Cain and names him Cain? What did, you, know, you see, you, you could just read the story and you and you can know the story, but if you don't dig into the word, then you're just going to remain a baby in Christ. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does. Let's 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 use an example. I got a good example. What's your favorite favorite uh, Bible verse? You tell them while I'm looking it up. John three sixteen. And what does John three sixteen say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a great verse, right? It's a great mm-hmm. verse. So let me ask you. That's what we've just done is taken some of the milk of the word. It's good, it's true, it's spiritually edifying, it's helpful, but it's not very deep. So let me ask you a question. When it says, and I have the text on the screen now, just so you know. When it says, for God so loved the world, what does that phrase, so loved, mean? Is that trying to tell us that God loved the world so much? Yes. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? But that's not what it means. Okay, I'm, I'm rocking his world. No, no, but this is what I mean. You digging into. So the Greek word there for so, okay, is is the word huto, okay? And it doesn't mean so. It means in this way. It means refers to what precedes. Okay? It means in this manner. Or even so. So let's look at the context of 316. We're going to back up a couple verses, okay, to verse uh, verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Do you know that story? Of Moses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness? And is that how we got his staff? No. Let me tell you the story, because it's important to what we're talking about here. It's in the book of Numbers. I don't remember exactly where. But I'll look it up later. I'll put a link to the book of, somewhere. Um, in the book of Numbers, the Israelites are in the desert, and there's there's a uh, the camp is run through with snakes, serpents, and anybody that's bitten by one of these snakes dies. That's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Anybody who gets bitten by one of these snakes dies. So God tells Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. Okay, so he tells Moses actually to make a, a, not a statue, but make a, make a, a, a serpent. Okay, 
And it says in verse 9, Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. So God told Moses, make something, make a serpent and put it on a pole and hold it up in the camp. Okay? Make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. So God tells Moses, make a serpent put it on a pole, and hold it up in the camp. And if anybody who's bitten by one of these things will look at the serpent on the pole, the serpent it won't kill them. Never heard that story? No. Okay. So let's go back to John chapter 3. Moses, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Well, let me ask you, what does that sound like? Lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, lifting up the serpent on a pole, and anybody who looks at the serpent is saved. What does that sound like? Mm. Can you think of somebody else who was lifted or something else that was lifted up on a pole, and if people will look to them, they would be saved? Jesus. It sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Right? So let's go back to chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. See, it's making a connection. It's saying, just like God saved the Israelites, God will, God will provide to save all of humanity. The so means... And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In this same way, God loved the world and gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you see what, what, what Jesus is doing there? He's, he's taking this story from the book of Numbers that people have known forever. And they all, all the, the Jews would have known the story in, of Moses in the wilderness. And he's saying, that was a picture of what's going to happen to me. In the same way that God gave Moses the ability to hold up a serpent and save his people, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Like, Jesus, remember Jonah's story? Mm -hmm. He was in the whale for three straight days and then got spat out. Mm hmm. Jesus was in the grave for three days. You know, that's exactly right. Do you think that was a picture of Christ also? I do too. And you know, it's funny because at one point, and we're really far afield, but this is good stuff. Um, at one point, the, the Pharisees are asking Jesus, Hey, show us a sign. Prove to us you are who you say you are. And do you know what Jesus says to them? He says, You, you murderous and idolatrous generation. No sign shall be given to you except this, the sign of Jonah. For as for three days and three nights Jonah was in the Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three nights, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So even Jesus thought the same thing, you know, and, and taught the same thing. Let's get back to our thing. That's the difference between milk and meat. Milk is for God to love the world that gave his only begotten Son. Meat is the picture of Christ raised on the cross, that whoever looks and looks to him for salvation, God will save, has its, has its shadow even back in the Old Testament when Moses lifted up a serpent and then anybody who looked at the serpent would be saved. That's getting to the meat of something. It's digging into it. And it's more than just reading a verse and being happy with it. Does that, does that make sense now, what mm -hmm. that means? Okay. May the Lord enable us to grow in his grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now you know a little bit more about the story behind John 3.16. And you can go tell Pastor David, maybe on Sunday, hey, you know, I learned something about John 3.16. And he'll say, well, what did you learn? And you can say, well, let's turn in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 21. And he will go... <laughs> anyway, no. say goodbye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've gotten something out of this. And hey, parents, if nothing else, your kids are capable of talking about theology with you if you'll talk about it with them. That's critically important. Okay? 
if I if we only give our kids milk, they'll never grow up to be adult Christians. They just won't. I Will think you? I know ways and the, the their children could be theologists. Why? Because mom at dinner once called me a theologist. <laughs> well, you are definitely a budding, aspiring theologian. That's for sure. That's for sure. Thanks again for joining us here on He's God, We're Not, and Daily Devotions with Dad. Uh, I'm Dad. He's Philip. And he's God, and we're not. not. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye.